Tonight we're going to be going over what a complex respiratory assessment is and exactly what that entails. So what is a complex respiratory assessment? And effectively, it's different from a regular respiratory in, uh, assessment in the sense that it adds more to it. So a complex respiratory assessment may involve um, complex equipment, so that could be some additional lines, tubes, and drains like an endotracheal tube or a tracheostomy, um, oxygen devices like a BiPAP or high flow oxygen, um, or other equipment in, uh, machines like a ventilator, the BiPAP machine, etc., um, that may need to be managed and they'll be a part of your assessment. Um, also, there may be just more frequent assessment and monitoring. Um, a lot of these patients are very in critical condition, and so they're going to have to be watched more closely. And we may have to do more detailed or thorough assessments um, involving their equipment or um, their general respiratory status. Uh, and additionally, we have to consider the fact that um, when someone is, for instance, intubated, they're going to most likely be immobile um, because of medications they're on. Um, so we really want to consider how those are going to affect them. So, you know, their general condition of being intubated is going to lead them to have possible complications of immobility like blood clots, skin breakdown, uh, musculoskeletal compromise like contractures, things like that, um, and then other effects of the sedative and paralytic medications, you know, changes to other organs, neurological status, things like that as well. Um, and we can't forget about nutrition. More than likely, you know, the person who's having very complex respiratory problems is going to have trouble getting appropriate nutrition, but they're definitely going to need it. So um, this is just a few examples of how the whole body is affected, but there's definitely much more. But as a whole, when you have more complex problems, um, you're also going to need more complex assessments and more complex monitoring. So let's begin with who is involved in the respiratory system. There are lots of key players, but effectively there's a whole lot of passageways that lead down into the lungs where a lot of the magic happens. Um, so we usually start with the nasal um, cavity, uh, you know, which actually serves a really important role to not only um, warm oxygen, but also humidify it for you. Uh, and um, some of us are mouth breathers, so our pharynx, um, whether our nasopharynx, our oropharynx, or our laryngopharynx play a role as well to um, provide a passageway for oxygen to get down to our lungs. Um, then we have what most people call the windpipe, the trachea, which is the tunnel down to your lungs. Um, and right before we start branching into the lungs, we have what's known as the crina, um, and that's effectively kind of like that branching point from right to left. Um, kind of like the crossroads, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and then once you're, um, you know, branching out into the lungs, um, you have the different parts of the lungs. So there's the bronchi, then it goes into smaller bronchioles, and then gets down to the real important part, which is the alveoli. And this is effectively where oxygen exchange happens. Those are those little grape-looking things in the picture there. Um, keep in mind, you know, most of the diseases and disorders we're talking about um, this semester are going to be talking about problems with those alveoli. Um, and in the lungs, you know, most of the problems are more lower airway than they are upper airway. Way. Um, but it's just important to kind of know these structures. Um, another honorable mention to the epiglottis, which, um, you know, effectively is that uh, tube that's going to help, or sorry, not tube, um, but a, the flap that helps to um, protect um, your food from not, uh, not going down into the lungs and you aspirating it. Um, so it's just another part of our body's protective mechanisms that help it um, in order so that we are able to breathe and swallow, you know, without um, simultaneously inhaling a lot of our food. So as we're talking about different problems, it's helpful to know that there's two main uh, functions within the respiratory system or two main processes and one is oxygenation and the other is ventilation and a lot of these go hand in hand of course um, but it's just important to kind of know that difference because when we're talking about different respiratory problems it's important to know you know what's the problem is it a problem of oxygenation or is it a problem of ventilation 
So um, oxygenation problems are all about that ability to obtain oxygen from the atmosphere and then get it to your organs and tissues. So, you know, we measure this by looking at your oxygen saturation, like that um, a lovely little probe that we put on patients' fingers. And then also through an arterial blood gas, we can look at what's known as a PaO2, which is the partial pressure of oxygen. It's effectively saying how much oxygen is in my artery. Um, and, uh, you know, it's affected by how much oxygen, of course, that you can get from the atmosphere, um, but it's also affected by that alveolar environment. So, um, you know, can O2 get through those little, um, you know, grape packages we looked at in the last slide? Um, is there oxygen able to get through? And when would oxygen not be able to get through? Well, think infection problems. So if someone has pneumonia or ARDS, we're going to look at it on the next slide, but there's all this junk that gets stuck in those alveoli. It makes it really hard to get oxygen in. Um, so um, that's usually what it would cause an oxygenation problem. Um, then a ventilation problem is all about that inhalation and exhalation processes and the physical forces that affect those. So this is, when we look at this, we're really looking at your carbon dioxide. Um, and it's affected by your lungs compliance. You know, how well can your lungs expand? Are they stiff? Are they, do they have room to move out? Um, is there any sort of airway resistance or um, any sort of like mucus, debris, anything staying in the way of that um, carbon dioxide getting out? So with this, think of them more like asthma, COPD, obesity can affect it because your body doesn't have that same ability to expand the lungs because it's pushing up against that extra um, you know, tissue that's in your stomach. Um, so think all mechanical problems where oxygenation is more infection issues. Ventilation is usually more of a mechanical problem, even though, again, they can go hand in hand. So another way to look at it is that oxygenation is the ability to get oxygen in, while ventilation is the ability to get CO2 out. And as you can see in this picture, um, it's going to be very hard to get oxygen in on that right-hand side if there's all that junk. And that's a lot of what alveoli look like when you have something like ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome. We're going to learn more about that um, in class, but it's just really good to know as a whole that um, you know on that right side, you know there's just too much junk that oxygen can't even get past that. I mean, that's what's really causing the oxygenation problem. It's not that they're not getting enough oxygen, it's that they can't get past all that other junk. So as we're taking care of this patient, if they're able to, we would like to ask them some important questions because this is going to tell us, especially as a critical care nurse, um, you know, if they're going to be more at risk um, being intubated, you know, what's their chances of being able to wean from the ventilator? Because um, people are intubated for different reasons, so it's really important to know kind of what other risk factors they may have that make it harder to get them off the ventilator or um, higher chance of complications while they are intubated or have other complex respiratory equipment being used. Um, so things like asking about their smoking history um, and getting more details about that can tell us because people that have a history of smoking are going to have more difficulty um, with that complex respiratory equipment and more respiratory problems in general. Um, we want to know their general symptoms. Do they feel short of breath? Um, any history of anything that's going to cause them to have more secretions, coughing, um, any mucus, allergies, frequent colds, things like that are going to help us to kind of see um, what they've been experiencing before. Um, and then also to look for those changes they might be having now. Um, additionally, looking at any respiratory or cardiac disease history, you know, anything, COPD, um, angina, um, asthma, TB, um, vascular issues, blood clots, things like that, all of that's going to tell us a lot about, um, you know, what kind of likelihood a patient's going to have um, to be able to get off that ventilator. And also, again, if they're going to be more at risk, like, you know, for example, someone who's had a history of a blood clot um, could be at higher risk to end up getting a pulmonary embolism, which could affect their ability to wean from that ventilator. So it's always just good to kind of know as a whole their history. Um, and then also, you know, how were things going? before they um, got to the hospital? Were they having a lot of breathing problems? Were they able to eat, walk, sleep, and things like that without difficulty? Is this new or is this something that's been chronically getting worse? Um, and then how many pillows do you sleep with at night? And this is really assessing for orthopnea, or in other words, is it hard for them to lay flat? Um, are they still able to breathe as their head of bed um, goes down? And this is really important when you're taking care of a patient because if they're having a lot of problems with this, um, they uh, may need, you know, some different Different positioning techniques to prevent complications so they don't uh, desaturate when you're repositioning them.
So we always start by assessing and we can start with our upper airway and we can look for a lot of problems. Um, you know, through the nose, we're going to, you know, be looking for any inflammation, any drainage. And of course, drainage can indicate, um, you know, that there's some sort of infection or, um, you know, upper airway illness going on. Um, any blockages can, um, you know, definitely affect the way that the person's getting in oxygen. You can also see what kind of breather they are. Are they more of a mouth breather? Or do they breathe in more through their nose? Because if you remember, we talked about how in the nose it warms and humidifies um, oxygen as it comes in and so a lot of times when we're using these complex respiratory devices um, you know a lot of times people end up you know having blockages in their nose and they end up breathing mostly through their mouth so we want to make sure that they have humidification to help them um, as they are using these devices um, we also want to look in the mouth and the throat um, and you know look for inflammation we, you know what is their mucous membranes is it dry moist any drainage any blockages Blockages. And this is really important, especially for that patient who's intubated, because um, this is going to tell us a lot. You know, if they have a really swollen airway, it's probably not going to be safe for a while for them to remove that tube, because if they have a really swollen airway and then we take that tube out, it's going to be really hard to get it back in. So we always have to consider, you know, the structures and the um, passageways to the lungs that can restrict a patient's ability um, to breathe adequately. Even if they don't have respiratory, like lower airway issues, if they have upper airway issues, um, they may need a tube in just to kind of keep everything open so that they don't have um, any sort of blockage. We also want to look other places for problems. So we want to look at their chest wall and make sure that it's symmetrical. Um, we can expect their skin for clubbing, and clubbing's in that lower picture. Um, and it can, it's just generally a long-term sign of um, difficulty oxygenating uh, and cyanosis as well. Um, we can look for the discoloration in the fingers, that bluish color. That's usually a late sign. Um, and in darker skin patients, you know, we have to look other places. We can look in their conjunctiva. We can look um, actually in their gum line, things like that as well. Uh, we want to look at their general respiratory effort. You know, do they look like they're working hard to breathe? Are they using extra muscles in their chest and their abdomen to breathe? Um, and what's their respiratory rate? You know, this is not usually something we want to tell them, hey, I'm counting your respiratory rate. We really like to, um, you know, look at their respiratory rate kind of casually as we're doing other parts of our assessment. Um, and respiratory rate can tell us a lot of things because respiratory rate can be affected by a lot of different things. But a lot of it tells us, you know, it's effectively kind of like when the heart's not getting enough of what it needs, whether it's fluid or oxygen, it pumps faster. And so it's the same with the respiratory rate. You start to breathe faster because your body's hoping to get more oxygen in. So a lot of times a faster respiratory rate is really telling you that, hey, I need more oxygen. I'm not getting enough. Something's missing. Um, but yes, again, there's many different reasons. So um, it's just good to kind of assess that and get a baseline. You also want to consider what's known as AP diameter or the anterior posterior diameter. Um, and so um, in a normal patient, um, you know, it's uh, there's a difference between it's effectively saying the width from the front to the back of your lungs and then from the side to side to your lungs. You can kind of see it better in this picture than I can explain it. Um, but certain people that have like COPD, emphysema, um, they can do have things what's called air trapping. Um, and what that means is that instead of having, um, you know, this kind of five to seven ratio, we go to a one to one ratio. So effectively, you know, the, um, the chest kind of gets what we call like a barrel chest where it gets hyperinflated. Um, and it's just, again, important to know this as you are taking care of these patients. If you don't know your patient's history, but you see they have a barrel chest, that's probably going to tell you they may have more problems um, with their respiratory equipment or getting um, weaned off the ventilator. So it's just a great way that you can know about your patient without actually having to ask them that question, that they could possibly have issues um, getting weaned from the ventilator and um, supported, they may need extra support with those respiratory devices more long term. So there's a variety of breathing patterns. Um, and of course, eupenia is you know, what we would love to have, you know, a respiratory rate of 12 to 20. Um, people that are um, not breathe, taking enough breaths, it's usually what we consider less than 10. And again, your book might have different numbers than these. We always go by what your book says, of course. Um, 
Tachypnea is um, usually something around greater than 22 to 24 breaths. Um, and it's usually fast and usually pretty shallow because you're breathing so fast you don't have as much time um, to exhale. Um, Kuzmals, if you remember, is those breaths that we take are kind of the rapid and deep. And those are you see in a patient like in diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, but they also can have them like we recently talked about with renal failure. Um, the biots you're not going to see very often. One you might see is what's called chain stokes. And what chain stokes in is it's kind of like where they do a whole bunch of rapid, fast breathing, not very effective, and then they just stop breathing. So it's like, <laughs> and then just stops. And then, <laughs> it's kind of like they're gasping for air every few seconds. Sometimes it takes longer. And sometimes you're watching them, you're like, okay, breathe. <laughs> you know, it's going to be kind of scary. And then there's apnea, which is, um, of course, absence of breathing, which is very significant. We definitely want our patients breathing. Uh, we may also note an abnormal breathing posture. So, um, you know, this is usually a sign of COPD or asthma, but at the tripod position where they're kind of leaning forward um, and trying to help with that expansion of their lungs. Most people think that, um, you know, uh, just being upright is what they need. Like someone sitting upright in the bed is um, the best way to expand lungs. But you have to keep in mind that how the lungs expand is not just out in front of us, but they expand behind us as well. And so if our back Back is up against the bed it doesn't have as much room to expand so that's why sometimes leaning forward actually allows for more expansion because it allows our lungs to expand back um, not just out front um, and then there's also pursed lip breathing which is where people kind of exhale kind of looks like they're whistling and this is a pro prolonged exhalation it's usually a sign someone has a lot of carbon dioxide and they're trying to blow it out they don't even do this necessarily consciously this is kind of a body's defense mechanism to help get that carbon dioxide out we can feel for problems. We can feel for symmetrical chest wall expansion. Um, we can feel for crepitus. We definitely need to do this um, if a patient has a chest tube. Um, so it's what we call the snap, crackle, pop. But it's where you literally feel on patients and it feels like you're popping that bubble stuff that you get when you get an Amazon package. Um, it, it feels really um, kind of crackly. Um, but effectively, if you feel this, this means there's air trapped in between their skin and their lung. Um, and so with that, it's just something good to note because it can be a sign that... Um, um, you know, there's some sort of air leak um, where they may end up having some difficulty breathing. So it's definitely something to um, keep a close eye on. Um, and then there's also tactile frimidus, which I have never in my life assessed, but um, it is something you can possibly assess, but it's really um, looking for vibrations. You'll see this uh, more advanced practitioners doing this, um, but it's effectively seeing kind of the um, ability for them to carry their voice through their lungs. And that can tell you a lot about um, what's going on in their lungs, whether there's, you know, kind of junk in there that's making it harder for those sounds to get out. So listening for problems, you know, this is probably what we most commonly think of when we think of a respiratory assessment. You know, we want the patient to take slow, deep breaths. Um, you know, I try not to make them take too many um, deep breaths, you know, um, back to back if I can help it. Um, you know, what I usually start out doing is kind of just seeing what they naturally can do on their own. But if I can't hear anything, then I'll ask them to take a deep breath. Because um, it's always good to see kind of how clear their lungs are without them taking deep breaths. And we listen in a couple different places. We listen kind of higher up in their upper airways. Um, we listen kind of down, kind of in those um, upper part of the bronchioles, the bronchiovesicular area. And then we want to listen in the lower areas and on the lateral sides. And that really gives us an idea of those alveoli, you know, if there's any junk in there, if there's any wet sounds, things like that. And there's a lot of different types of adventitious sounds. Um, you know, I'm not going to go into these too in depth. This is something that, of course, takes time, and it's a skill that I can't really talk about over here. But I'm going to post some websites that you can kind of look at and listen if you want to get up on your skills listening to lung sounds. But there's crackles, wheezes, and ronchi are some of the common ones you're going to hear. And to break these down, you know, effectively, if you're thinking crackles, coarse, rails, ronchi, all those words, think wet. And it's usually associated with fluid accumulation or infection. Um, on the other hand, if you hear the words wheezing and strider, think closed or restricted airway. I mean, both of these are going to come into play. Like a patient with ARDS is usually going to have some sort of crackles or coarse lung sounds. They have all that junk building up in their alveoli. Whereas someone who um, was maybe in respiratory failure, um, we're going to be really really worried if we're hearing any sort of strider or like, you know, it's pretty much that crowing sound um, when that tube is removed because that's usually a sign that there's a really restricted airway.
Um, so here's just those are just a couple examples of how we can apply this to some of the um, you know disease processes we're going to be talking about for this section. So additional assessments we need to do um, for complex patients with respiratory problems um, is, you know, we want to look at their oxygen equipment. What is it? You know, how much oxygen are they getting? How much flow? And that's a part of our, you know, uh, assessment that we should be doing. Um, in the ICU, we do assessments usually about every four hours. Um, sometimes we may need to do it more frequently if we're making changes. Um, if they're on the ventilator, we want to know what settings they're on. And I have a picture on the next slide so we can talk more about it there. Um, I want to compare this with the rest of our our assessment. So, you know, how does, based on, you know, if I have a patient who, um, you know, is on a whole lot of oxygen, is it helping them? What's their oxygen level with this much oxygen? Um, if they're on really heavy settings on the ventilator, what's their respiratory rate? Is it working? Does it seem like they're still struggling to breathe even with this extra support? Um, and again, looking at those accessory muscles and things like that they might be using. Um, we want to assess the tubes, of course, for patency, making sure that, you know, um, obviously if it's like a endotracheal tube that we can hear lung sounds, um, you know, the air going in and out. Um, we also want to um, see what size tube they have, make sure that it's appropriate, it's fitted well. So if it's like a BiPAP mask, something like that, or high flow, we want to make sure everything's fitted well, um, that it's correct placement. So like with an endotracheal tube, we check the placement um, at least um, every four hours, making sure it's still in the same place. Um, skin integrity, because a lot of these devices can cause a lot of skin breakdown, and we're going to talk more about that. Um, and then also a good heat assessment. So, you know, um, we want to see uh, not just if there's any skin breakdown, um, but, you know, sometimes these devices can affect the teeth. It can um, lead to higher chance of infection. So we really want to uh, do a good assessment of that. Uh, we may also want to assess their sputum and see, you know, what color is it? Um, you know, how much is it? Um, is it thick? Is it thin? Et cetera, because that can tell us if maybe there's an infectious process going on. So additionally, like I mentioned, there's other equipment we need to look at and a lot of screens. So this left-hand picture is a picture of a ventilator. And we're going to talk more about this in class, but effectively everything at the bottom, all those numbers at the bottom, that's what we want the patient to do. Like, so these are the settings. Then at the top, all those numbers at the top, the top of the screen is what the patient's actually doing. Um, so like how many breaths they're actually taking, you know, um, things like that, how much volume they're actually getting, etc. cetera. Um, so um, this is a part of our assessment. We want to see as a whole, you know, how um, it's going for this. And many people are like, oh, that's the respiratory therapist job. But no, it's actually a part of our assessment too, is to really see how things are going. And while we may not understand all of these graphs and grids, and we definitely don't have to, you know, understand it on a deep level, we need to know the basics. Um, so that we can, um, you know, not only just rec make recommendations, but know when there's a problem um, and if, it, if the treatment that they're getting is effective or if it's not. Um, same, this upper right is a BiPAP and um, same thing where, you know, there's settings at the bottom and then what they're actually doing at the top. So we would just want to assess that. Um, and then, like I mentioned, um, we also want to assess the equipment. So this woman has an endotracheal tube. So we'd want to assess, you can see there's markings on the side. So we always like to see where that tube is marked right at the teeth um, to make sure it stays in the same place and then we also want to assess that holder that it's um, that's around them um, the people can get really bad skin breakdown from this and so we want to make sure we're moving that tube side to side um, and usually we move it every at least every um, two to four hours um, just to make sure that they're not getting breakdown on one side of their mouth or cheek so here are some pictures of when things go wrong. You can see, you know, that upper left, that's someone who had one of those, um, you know, devices attached to their cheek. Um, it caused a lot of breakdown. And these other two are showing things that can happen to the lip, um, you know, from having um, chronic um, pressure. So it's actually um, the device associated pressure injuries are becoming, you know, one of the most uh common type of pressure injuries we're seeing in patients. So it's really important that we, um, you know, try to change out equipment frequently, that we're moving this tube, we're really looking at the skin, not just, you know, the obvious stuff, but underneath these devices, uh, that we're doing a very thorough assessment.
Uh, additionally, you know, we want to, uh, we might do some diagnostic studies related to respiratory system. Um, so patients most likely are going to be on a pulse oximetry, continuous. Um, they may do what's called nocturnal oximetry, which is where we um, kind of just watch them overnight looking for sleep apnea. Uh, a lot of patients, especially those that were worried, um, might be retaining ca carbon dioxide. They might be on what's called entitled CO2, which is effectively seeing, you know, how much um, CO2 that they're um, retaining effectively and that can be actually done even now with some nasal cannulas they have these new fancy ones um, that can measure that um, but you can also do that other ways as well um, labs our most common lab for a respiratory patient that's having complex issues is going to be an ABG or an arterial blood gas and that's where we're checking the acid base balance and the general oxygenation status uh, we may also get cultures which can tell us if there's any sort of infection going on in the patient um, CT MRI can look for fluid infection, can tell us a lot more, um, you know, uh, an x-ray can tell us a lot about that whited out, um, you know, appearance that we usually see in a patient with ARDS. Um, we can also look for tumors, any sort of other abnormalities. Um, and then if we were worried about a pulmonary embolism, we can get a spiral CT or also um, there's what's called a VQ scan. Um, and all of these can kind of tell us if there is some sort of, um, you know, blockage there in the vasculature. Uh, last but not least, there's also some procedures. A patient can get a bronchoscopy. It can be for diagnostic um, purposes, um, you know, just to kind of see, hey, what's going on inside? You know, is there a blockage? Is there something, um, you know, inside the lungs? And, um, you know, this is more at the upper structures and things like that, like a mucus plug or something like that, um, or a tumor, things like that. We can also use it to treat a patient. We can take some of that mucus out. Um, we can do a biopsy um, and other things like that as well, um, just to try to clean them out a little bit, um, you know, kind of wash them out. Um, and it can definitely help a patient who's maybe been intubated, but it's like kind of getting worse. We kind of sometimes like to look inside to see if there's um, some reason that they're getting worse. Maybe there's too many secretions. Maybe there's a new infection. Um, maybe there's um, something wrong with the placement of their tube. But as a whole, let's bronchoscopy can give us a lot of information. Again, we can also do a lung biopsy, which we can usually do through that bronchoscopy. Um, and then there's also thoracentesis, which is, um, you know, effectively just removing um, fluid in the space, which is in between the pleura, the lining of the lungs. Um, and um, you'll see that often, you know, patients with heart failure, liver disease, um, cancer infection, and general lung disease, they have, uh, it's commonplace for them to accumulate fluid, especially in that lining of that um, pleural lining. So um, it's just something to keep in mind. And this picture is just of some other pulmonary function tests and things that can be done. Um, just depends on what the patient's history is and, um, you know, maybe why they're in the hospital. But lots of different procedures. This is really just kind of a basic introduction to some of the common ones you'll see. Well, I hope this was helpful for you. Uh, I will be looking forward to teaching you more about these fun respiratory diseases in class.